and I'll be leading you through today's presentation on behalf of the Languages and Culture team. Please be aware that today's session is being recorded and will be made available through our statewide staff room in Teams and on our Languages New South Wales YouTube channel. If you haven't already done so, please type your name and school in the chat pod. And if you are joining us with colleagues, please add the names as well. I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the lands on which we are meeting today and pay my respects to elders past, present and future and the importance of observing their cultures, customs and traditions of Aboriginal Australia. I'm delivering from the lands of the Darug people and this is a photograph of a sunset in Parramatta River. Just a reminder to join our statewide staff from in Microsoft Teams, if you haven't already. Maxine will post the entry survey link into the chat. The survey takes only a minute to complete and once you submit it, you'll automatically be added to the team. So far, we have 454 teachers there and it's a wonderful place to spend a little bit of time each week. In response to the new K-10 syllabuses and queries from teachers last year, we have prepared this session on points to consider when developing your assessment schedule. And I will be taking you through each of the areas listed on this slide. The purpose and characteristics of a quality uh, assessment, an effective schedule, and approaches to preparing a schedule. Let's start with a quick refresh of assessment. Assessment opportunities, when designed well, support you to monitor student progress and inform next steps in your teaching, the effectiveness of your teaching and learning strategies, and measure student achievement of the outcomes across a unit of work. It's critical to keep that last dot point in mind. Assessment must be based on syllabus outcomes. As such, a vocab test cannot be used for assessment as there is no outcome relating to knowing words in the target language. Assessment schedules are not about the number of scheduled tasks. They are about high quality assessment opportunities which support student learning. In setting assessment tasks, teachers should give careful consideration to the syllabus outcomes being assessed. By measuring student achievement of these outcomes, you can build a profile of each student using the common grade scale or towards the end of stage five, the course performance descriptors. While we don't use the course performance descriptors until the end of stage five for student grading for the ROSA, they do provide an excellent reference point for you, uh, for, for where you want to see where students uh, should be at by the end of stage five. And so these are a great resource when planning assessment. Ongoing assessment means assessment tasks are set and marked at regular intervals with feedback given each time. Assessment reporting about school-based decisions. In New South Wales Public Schools, these decisions are underpinned by the curriculum planning and programming, assessing and reporting to parents K-12. In stages four and five, there are no requirements set by NESA. There is no minimum or maximum limit for number of tasks, just as there is no minimum or maximum weighting requirement. In fact, many schools are now moving away from weightings. This doesn't mean, however, that we shouldn't properly consider what would be a suitable number of tasks so that we are accurately gathering student data without leaving students feeling overwhelmed. If you opt for weightings in stages four and five, allocating weightings to each of the assessment tasks is up to the professional judgment of the teachers and school executive, according to the relative importance of each task. Take a balanced approach if you opt for weightings. 
it's worth pointing out that changes recently introduced in stage six, individual tasks would not normally be worth less than 10%, nor more than 40% of the total weight mark. And the total of tasks are capped to three in year 11 and four in year 12. When deciding on the weightings, have you considered the level of difficulty? The relative importance of aligned intended learning outcomes must be considered when allocating a weighting. In other words, does the task justify the weighting? When deciding on the weighting of the task, did you consider the timing of the task? Is this a student's first task in the course? Placing too high a weighting on the first task may not be warranted if the learning outcomes have been just covered for the first time or if you haven't had a chance to introduce slightly more challenging concepts. Further to this, what would be the implications of placing too much weighting on the first task and the students not performing well? Language learning is a cumulative skill and your assessment schedules should really be reflecting this. Remember that tasks should be set at regular intervals. By spacing your tasks and allocating balanced weightings across all tasks, you are assessing the student's progress and incorporating that information into your teaching and giving students more balanced opportunities to demonstrate their skills in varied and rich tasks. The spacing between each task also affects A, student workload within the course and within their other subjects. Remember that language is one subject of perhaps eight or nine. B, provision and use of good quality feedback. And C, marking considerations. An effective schedule. The key aim of assessment schedules is to provide students with a comprehensive record of the learning opportunities planned for them to demonstrate their skills. From a student's perspective, the aim of a schedule is to provide information about what is expected from them throughout the year and how their work will be assessed. There are no performance mandated by NESA or the department. However, you may find that your school will have designed performance either for whole school um, use or to follow, or faculties may have designed their own to suit their needs and context. If the main aim is to inform students with detailed information which will support them in successfully completing these tasks, we must be selective in what and how we provide this information. Let's take a look at what and how we could consider including in an assessment schedule. An effective schedule will support students to successfully complete all tasks on time. So let's provide them with the information they need to succeed. To succeed. What's in a schedule? The number of tasks. We need to remember that students have many subjects. The description of the task must be clear. The information provided will differ from task to task, but it should always make sense to the student. We need to be transparent and use school-friendly language. Due date. Your students need to know this to make sure they adhere to timelines. School-wide consultation should be part of the process in developing assessment schedules for each year group so that students don't have many tasks during the same week. Outcomes assessed. We teach and report to outcomes, so students need to know how the tasks align to what they are currently learning and to syllabus content. Weighting. From a teacher viewpoint, we could argue that it's not about the mark or the weighting. However, it's an option schools may choose to adopt. Some students would like to know what weighting is placed on the task. This will give them an indication of the level of difficulty and also the involvement and time they need to invest on it. Again, I repeat that this is a school decision and I say this because we are now moving away from marks and many schools are focusing on allocation of grades from A to E. 
Not all schedules will then have weightings. You may also wish to consider adding more information to suit your context and or to comply with school policy and requirements. For example, if the task is in class, a take home or a formal examination. I'm now going to show you different ways you can approach an assessment schedule based on just three of the contexts we hear about in schools. A summative end of year approach, or sorry, um, yes, or end of unit approach rather, a cumulative approach over the course of a term, and an exam approach. Within the Languages and Culture team, you'll notice our approach is generally to have a summative task at the end of each unit. However, we understand you need to, you need to uh, meet the needs of your school's context. As you know, with the implementation of the new K-10 syllabuses, we no longer teach the four micro skills discreetly, and we don't report on the micro skills discreetly either. So how can we design an assessment schedule which addresses a range of outcomes through a variety of approaches? Let's take a look. Approach one. While we continue to teach students how to read, write, speak and listen in the target language, it's done through the communicating and understanding strands with objectives addressing a range of skills. For example, accessing and responding can relate to listening or reading a text and responding in writing or through spoken text. As well as this, our syllabuses are task-based syllabuses. So let's look at this concept a little bit closer, particularly in relation to summative assessment, also known as assessment of learning. The new K-10 language syllabuses are task-based, and in the glossary of terms at the back of the K-10 language syllabuses, a learning task is described as Learning tasks are relevant and significant learning experiences that involve purposeful language use. Unlike form-focused language activities and exercises, the learning task involves actual goal or purpose. Learning tasks provide opportunities to draw on existing language resources and to experiment with new forms. Learning tasks provide the organizing structure and context for meaning-focused language learning. So you can see here that the learning task provides the organizing structure for focused language learning. This means that the structure as the means that we structure our teaching based on our learning tasks. This is something that we really need to understand and reflect on the implications it has when planning, programming and assessing. It also means that our final learning task is the assessment of learning task. These learning tasks are central to our programming and their assessing. In the programming uh, support provided by the Languages and Culture team at the department, you'll notice your assessment of learning tasks are outlined in your scope and sequence documents. This is not mandated by NESA, nor is it mandated by the department. However, our team does recommend including assessment on the document. This is because we also recommend you provide a copy of your scope and sequence to students at the start of the year to give them a sense of what they may be able to achieve by the end of, uh, of the year or stage, which can be really motivating. Our team also recommends a backward mapping approach to programming. By using each final assessment of learning task to backward map each unit of work, identifying the teaching and learning strategies which will lead our students to the successful achievement of the assessment of learning task. This includes assessment as and assessment for learning tasks, which act as checkpoints along the way, and in which students can check and receive feedback on their progress. Finally, our assessment of learning tasks are incorporated in our assessment schedule. Let's take a look at a sample scope and sequence document from our website. This, is, this example is for stage five Japanese. 
You'll find samples across 10 languages on your site for stages four and five. So if you haven't visited recently, it might be a, a good time to check your uh, website again. You'll see the URL on my last slide today. Here, there are four assessment of learning tasks, one per term, with the outcomes to be assessed each time. These tasks could form the basis for your schedule. Here they are again, just a little bit bigger. I'll give you a moment to scan. Let's take a look at the first task appearing in the scope and sequence and how we could summarize it in a few words for the schedule. You have just returned from an excursion to the Hongatankan Center where you meet students from another school. You made a new friend who loves Japanese as much as you do. Write an email inviting her to spend Saturday together. In the email, ask her what they would like to do and, and propose a series of activities that you could do together. Outcomes assessed, 4C, 5U and 7U. If you summarize, um, uh, summarize it like this, it will be clear to students that they will be completing a writing task. And in this case, we're also letting them know the text type. The students don't need to know the details of the task, but I do believe that we are supporting them by giving them a general idea of the skills required to manage the task. This is the second assessment of uh, learning appearing in a scope and sequence. In preparation for your trip to Japan, your sister school wants to know where you live and what sort of things you like to do around your home so they can match you with the appropriate host family, have an online call or phone conversation with the teacher in Japan about your home life and express your preferences with reasoning, outcomes 1C, 5U uh, and 7U. Here, Let's know that the task consists of a dialogue. It's about clearly providing students with information that they need to organize their thoughts. We always say that we can never give students too much information, provided that the information we do provide is meaningful to them. We must remember that they are our target audience. And here is an example of what my assessment schedule would begin to look like if I use this approach. You can see I've included a bit more information, such as whether the students complete the task in class or at home, as well as the waiting. Waitings are a requirement at my school, but may not be required at yours. You can see I haven't included the unpacking of each outcome. I have only included the codes. However, your school may require the full wording. For term three and term four, I'm going to use different approaches. Just to give you a sense of what's possible. Let's take a look at the second approach, using assessment for learning activities and tasks to cumulatively assess throughout the term. We are going to look at how we can use a series of assessment for learning as part of your assessment schedule. If you have looked at our generic class party unit, this actually takes this approach. The students create a party planner's portfolio over the course of the term. What types of assessment for learning activities and tasks could you use for cumulative assessment? Once again, this is up to your professional judgment, keeping in mind that the activities you select must assess achievement of the outcomes. In scripted languages, you can include a written quiz relating to new characters. This is because in scripted languages, there is an outcome relating to the language's written conventions. As mentioned earlier, this is different to a vocabulary test, which doesn't align to any of the outcomes and so cannot be used for assessment. That doesn't mean you can't give your students vocabulary quizzes. They absolutely have their place. But it does mean a vocabulary quiz does not form part of an assessment schedule. This is another example 
of an assessment for learning activity you could use towards your overall assessment for the term. This assessment could occur over several lessons, so you have time to see each student in action. This is an interacting activity mapped 1C and 5U. And here's a third example. Let's revisit my assessment schedule to see what this approach looks like. I used summative assessment of learning tasks for terms one and two. For term three, I will use a cumulative assessment for learning approach. And this is what it looks like on my schedule. This series of activities mentioned are from the previous slides. Here's a comparison of the cumulative approach, which I have just unpacked for you, compared to the summative approach, which is what was on this Scoping sequence. I'll just give you a moment. The difference between the two approaches is this. With cumulative assessment, you're capturing the evidence of student achievement at different points in the learning looking carefully at their preparation to complete a rich language task. With a summative assessment, you're capturing a moment in time. Either approach is valid, and you use your professional judgment to decide which approach best suits your context and your student needs. Does the cumulative approach mean students don't do the final task on the right? Not necessarily. If students can still complete the summative task, but it's the cumulative assessment which is in your schedule, not the summative task. I said earlier that assessment and reporting is a school-based decision. As part of this, you may be at a school which has exam periods, but you can still assess using authentic tasks which promote deep and rich learning. It's a matter of where might exams fit in an assessment schedule and how can I effectively incorporate my assessment for learning activities in it too? It can be said that what we want is to provide students with a range of assessment measures throughout the year to maximize their opportunities to dem demonstrate what they know and what they can do. This is an example that looks more like an end of the year exam. What I really like about this example is that while yes, it is an exam, it follows the principles of an authentic task and it's done under exam conditions. In part A, the students read a text in Japanese about an exchange program to Japan and they answer questions in English. In part B, the students write about why they would like to be accepted into the program. And in part C, the students imagine they have been accepted into the program and make a voice recording introducing themselves to the host family. This is where we were up to with your assessment schedule. So now I need to add in term four, the fourth and final task. I have taken the exam example I have just shown you in the previous slide and slotted it as my fourth and final task. So this is my final schedule designed for year 10 students. Two end of term authentic tasks, a number of formative assessments and the end of year exam. This is not a definitive approach, mind you, because our aim here is to give you a range of approaches to consider. So let's have a look at other examples. This is another example I created, but this time with year nine in mind and without waitings. I have also, uh, also chosen not to schedule the assessment for learning activities this time. And as I developed it, I made sure I knew exactly what outcomes I wanted to assess and how I wanted to assess them. All the while making sure I also target all micro skills 
at some point. For example, in the end of year um, exam, you will note that I decided not to assess speaking. We know this because five years missing. I'll just give you a moment. The tasks I'm referring to in the schedule are task one, task two, and last task three. This example has been adapted from Study the School of Community Languages. There are no weightings, but the grades are clearly shown. The grades are determined by very clear and detailed marking guidelines. This schedule has four tasks, including a series of assessments uh, for learning. How to approach your schedule? You would have realized by now that an assessment schedule is not a document you can effectively develop in isolation. This is a document that has to align with your scope and sequence and your units of work. And so there are a number of elements to consider. Selection of outcomes. What outcomes will you be assessing? Remember that you must teach all outcomes, but you don't need to assess all the outcomes formally. How will you be assessing your outcomes? For example, 1C uses language to interact with others to exchange information, ideas and opinions and make plans can be assessed orally through conversation or the focus of the interaction could be writing, such as a series of text messages. It's the same outcome being assessed, yet different micro skills, because the focus is on the interaction, not on the speaking or the writing. To ensure you assess a wide range of outcomes and in different micro skills, you must map them out first in your scope and sequence, then in your programming, and last but not least in your schedule. The only way to effectively align them is to have them intricately connected. Make sure you have a balance of outcomes. You don't have to assess all the outcomes formally and you shouldn't be assessing the same once over and over. A balance of micro skills. Remember, you can have the same outcomes assessing different micro skills as mentioned in the previous slide. A balance of assessment measures. All measures have a purpose and a place, provided that they are valid, inclusive, reliable and objective. It's up to you to make those decisions for your students. Make sure you are providing a variety of ways that students can demonstrate their learning. And a balance in waiting, if your school uses waitings. Consider when the task is due in relation to your course and the level of difficulty of the task. An even spread will reduce students' anxiety and give you clearer results, more indicative of what students can do. I will leave you with the wise words of Albert Einstein. Everything should be made, made as simple as possible, but not simpler. Thank you so much for joining us today. We do hope uh, you have enjoyed the session. We will add our presentation to our statewide staff room and the recording of the session to our YouTube channel. You can see the URL for our website there as well.